hi everyone. Hi. Thank you for an awesome musical introduction. Uh, thanks, Christy. Uh, all right, let's do this. Um, I want you to know this talk is truly open source. Um, I have stolen the very best ideas um, from many smart people that I have talked to over the last um, couple months uh, about the things that I'm going to talk to you about today. And um, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Here's your uh, hashtags. Um, in particular for this talk, you can use um, the acronym PUOSU for put up or shut up. Um, and of course, the OSB official hashtag. Um, there's some trigger warnings for this talk. Uh, there will be references to uh, discrimination, bigotry, assault, terrorism. Uh, there will be some calling people out on their bullshit. And by, by people, of course, I mean corporations. Um, <laughs> and there'll be uh, some mild profanity. Oh, damn it, that's in the wrong order, sorry. Um, <clears throat> all right. So three years ago, I won a ticket, a uh, raffle ticket, to my first open source bridge. Hadn't even heard of OS Bridge before that. Um, so I, I managed to get permission to take time off of work. And then when the week actually came, I started getting some pushback from my boss that we were too busy and there was too much going on. And, and so I basically had to sneak out of the office uh, seven blocks away and uh, come up here. And so I did that, and I sat where you are sitting right now, and I watched Sumana Hari Hareshwara give the keynote that year, which you've already seen reference. Thanks, Reed. <laughs> um, and the title was uh, Be Bold, an Origin Story. And um, after the talk, I went up to talk to her, and I was kind of complaining about some of the frustrations that I was having at work, and she said to me, oh, you should quit your job. <laughs> and I was like, I, I can't quit my job, I have kitty mouths to feed, and like that's, I can't do that. And it just seemed like a really out, outlandish idea to me. So I didn't, I didn't really think about it that much, but uh, as it turned out, time went by, and a, a few months later, I was involuntarily separated from that job. And it was explained to me that it wasn't, it wasn't my work, my work was fine, it wasn't a good culture fit. And they were gonna move away from work-life balance, and towards career advancement. Um, so like many bad relationships, I'm sure some of you have experienced this, while I was in it, I thought everything was fine. <laughs> right? I had just gotten a promotion the month before, I had gotten a raise, I had meetings with my managers uh, to talk about my career trajectory, um, so I thought everything was good. Uh, and then suddenly, like, there I was, you know, out on the street. And a funny thing happened in the time that it took me uh, to pack up my stuff and actually go home. Um, at first I was angry, and then I discovered another emotion, which was immense <laughs> relief. Uh, it took less than 12 hours for me to look back uh, on my day-to-day -day life at work and realize just how ha unhappy I had been and how much subtle and blatant discrimination that I had been putting up with uh, on a daily basis. But it was fine. Everything worked out in the end. And now I run my own business. And I have a few uh, useless employees who hang around and sleep on the job <laughs> or tweet all day. They have their own Twitter account now. So why am I standing up here and talking to you about jobs and employers today? It's because of a statistic that if you've ever read any article about diversity in tech, you have probably heard the statistic that 50% of women in tech quit the industry within 10 years. Not quit their jobs, quit the entire industry. And even though I work for myself, I talk to and hang out in chat rooms and on mailing lists and in person with a lot of women who work for technology companies that most of us here know. Uh, the same companies who are gonna be in the lounge later telling you about how they're hiring and who are in some cases very public about their diversity efforts um, and trying to improve. And I hear the same frustrating stories over and over again about these companies, and I realized a few months ago that I was literally watching this statistic play out in my peer group. And it was really startling to realize that. And they talk about 
you know, if there's any place to work that isn't going to be terrible, and they celebrate when they're the only woman on the team, on the engineering team, but the men are, are actually respectful. Like, that's, that's considered a win. Um, and they talk about saving up for the day when, you know, they can no longer deal with the stress, and they just decide to flip the table uh, and get the hell out of Dodge. And when you think about it, it's not really surprising that things have not improved that much because we're still kind of new at this, right? <laughs> the, the very notion that discrimination and exclusion of marginalized people in tech is seen as a problem is pretty new. Like, it's only been the last few years where you can start that conversation with that assumption without trying to justify it and, you know, read 12 pages of the Geek Feminism Wiki. Um, and we're working against hundreds and hundreds of years of racism, sexism, bigotry, white supremacy in the overall culture. So it's not really surprising that, you know, we have no idea what we're doing, right? And we don't know how to fix it. But it's tech and we're innovators and we pride ourselves on being problem solvers. So what do you do when you have a problem? Well, you study it. So there's lots of studies. Um, and I love a good study as much as the next person, but it's not like we haven't been talking about this for a long, long time. <laughs> and I find that there's a really persistent failure of people to just listen to the people who are actually living through these experiences um, until we have all the facts. We need to have all the facts. Um, and some companies have now decided to start throwing money at this problem. So uh, first up, we have Google. And Google is throwing down a cool $150 million to get more women and minorities into technology. They didn't even say just like that for us to hire, just into technology. So that's, that's great. Um, and then Intel came along and said, hey, Google, we will see your $150 million, and we will raise you $150 million. Um, and then, of course, there's GoDaddy, always. <laughs> always doing the least by trying to just buy their way out of their <laughs> shitty reputation. And there's a lot of talk about the numbers. Why is it so hard to move the numbers? You know, everyone's very concerned with measuring and because you need a way to figure out uh, if your efforts are working right and what's more measurable than numbers. But we can't measure success only by just having more employees from underrepresented groups than we did last year. We also have to ha ask, what is the experience of those employees who are working for you? And what is your retention of those employees? And if they are quietly leaving because your work conditions are unsafe, then you can't make meaningful positive change on a large scale without cleaning up your own house. So we have this huge disconnect between how some CEOs kind of see their progress and their efforts and how some of us <laughs> might see those efforts. Um, and as minorities who spend days, years, entire careers, uh, someone said, you know, in their entire career, they've never not been the only black person on the, on the engineer, engineering team. And so we, we are measuring by a different criteria. When we're trying to decide, um, how to, you know, whether we should even apply for that job, um, we're measuring differently. So, Hitmonk is a company that maybe some of you used to get here. You can go on there and you can look up flights and then you can sort them by agony. And agony is things like, well, how many connections are there and how long are the layovers and, you know, are they going to charge me for my carry-on bags, things like that. So, when we're trying to figure out whether we should apply for your company, we're doing a similar calculation. <laughs> okay, how much are you going to pay me? And is that worth the almost inevitable day-to-day -day bullshit that I'm going to have to put up with? And what have other people's experiences been? And is it worth it? Is it even worth it? And we already know that at least half the time for women, the answer is a resounding nope. <laughs> Peace out. Okay? And there's a whisper network and a back channel, and we, yes, we tell each other about your shitty culture. We tell each other about your serial sexual harassers. We tell each other about your shitty recruiters. We tell each other about your unfair pay structures. We tell each other when you decline to hire us at all simply because we try to negotiate. OK? 
Okay, so if you find that you're having trouble attracting diverse applicants despite all your efforts, it might be that your perception of your reputation doesn't quite match up <laughs> with the people that you're trying to attract. The bottom line is that as a company, your actions speak louder <clears throat> than your, about your values than your words or your money. For example, Twitter has acquired or merged with 41 companies since 2008, and they've spent $625 million that we know of uh, to acquire companies who um, invented features that they decided they wanted or needed. Um, and yet, they choose to uh, ignore their rampant abuse problem and just let women's organizations or individual uh, women developers work on that for free with no, no financial support. Um, and they've done things like this this month. They finally made, they finally figured out uh, shared blocking so that we can try to share, collectively protect ourselves from, you know, trolls who are mounting full-scale attacks against the most vulnerable Twitter users. So they finally came out with this feature with no acknowledgement and no funding for people like Randy Harper, who, you know, all by herself has been working alone and unfunded to try to solve this problem for months. So, you know, I don't know what goes on at the inner workings of Twitter. I'm sure they have their reasons for these things, but I'm just saying I have questions. And look, maybe I'll never work in this town again, but I'm just the messenger. And I'm saying these things because people are legitimately afraid of the backlash that will happen if they speak up. And because I'm not trying to get hired by anyone, um, I decided to try to take those messages and share them with you. So a few weeks ago, I put up a survey and I invited people to anonymously share their experiences, good and bad, about their employers. And the first thing I asked is uh, about their identity. Um, so here's some of the things that they shared. Diversity, uh, in a lot of ways, is still code for women, and um, specifically code for white women. But obviously, diversity, oops, sorry. Diversity comes in lots of forms, both visible and invisible. And we often talk about um, minorities in tech. Um, but last month at the Teaching Tech Together Summit, one of the presenters shared uh, an alternate view that um, I really like. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things that make up people's identities that you may or may not see. So, what this person said was about reframing the conversation, that we really have an over-representation of a minority in tech. And if you add up all the subpopulations that we're missing, women and minorities and people with special needs, then we're missing 70% of the people. So we need to actually address that imbalance and, and reframe the conversation. I also asked them, how has your identity affected your career? And these are some of the things that they said. Things like getting paid less, things like getting fired for culture fit. I didn't even write that, by the way, so that's not me. Um, there was a lot of talk about fear. There was a lot of talk about being forced to go along or otherwise be ostracized or considered a problem. Um, there was a lot of talk about pay inequality, and there was a lot of talk about so-called second shift work and being expected to do things that other people aren't expected to do and not being compensated for it. And that's just the people who are already in the industry, right? Then there are people who are struggling to even get here. And, you know, you could walk into any coffee shop within a 15-mile radius of this spot and see tables and tables full of shiny MacBooks. Um, but if you don't even have the tools, you know, how are you going to even get into the industry? How are you going to fit in in all those hackathons? Open source maintainers, you are losing people before they even begin because it's too dangerous or people are scared to join your forums or your IRC channels because they're worried about how they might be treated. 
and career advice like speak at conferences, make a name for yourself, blog. Those don't work for everyone because everyone isn't safe to do those things. And then sometimes they just don't even sugarcoat it. So I started thinking about some other paradigms and what kind of models we could use to think about this problem. So I want to talk to you now about babies and test-driven development. <laughs> so what do you do? What do people do when they find out they're going to have a baby, right? They, first, they freak out. Okay, but after that, generally, they spend several months buying a crib, buying a stroller, getting the little mobile to put over the crib, buying way too many toys, all these things, right? Why, why do people do that? Because they want the baby to feel welcome and they want the baby to be safe. All right? They don't just toss the kid on the floor and wait until they're old enough to talk and demand better sleeping conditions. <laughs> and in test-driven development, you start out with a goal in mind for what you want your application to do, and then you write tests for the conditions you want before you even write a line of production code. And then when you do start writing that production code, you expect it to fail. And you keep iterating on that until the tests pass, until you improve. So what can we learn from those two models? One is that <clears throat> creating the right environment is crucial if you want people to feel, feel welcome. You can't just bring people down the pipeline to the sewage plant and think that you're gonna actually solve the problem. And the second thing is that you're gonna fail. You're gonna fail often and you should expect that. And as programmers, uh, we should be used to that. Um, and in tech, we glorify people who are self-starters, who are motivated, who are willing to keep at it, who are willing to exhaust all the resources at their disposal to learn new technologies. So can someone please explain to me why we completely fail at this when it comes to applying these techniques to social problems? I just, I just want to bring some common sense into the equation. So I have a quiz for you. You have a bucket. Your bucket is leaking half of the water each hour. What should be your first step to fixing this problem? Should you get a bigger hose and put more water in the bucket? <laughs> should you fix the leak? Should you give money to Black Girls Code? <laughs> or should you do both B and C? Uh, both B and D are acceptable answers, and um, good programmers concern themselves not with just getting the code to work, but also with preventing inefficiencies that lead to waste. And we should be doing that with our human resources as well. But sadly, the bucket is still very leaky. So I asked my secret anonymous panel, what have your employers done badly or failed to do that made it harder for you to succeed? And here's what they said. Second shift, diversity work that is uncompensated. Pro tip, diversity work is not, in fact, its own reward. <laughs> it is actually a second job that you are not being paid to do. And it will hold back your career because that is time that you could spend improving your skills and networking and advancing your career. Uh, people have had others take credit for their work. They've been passed over for promotions and raises, and uh, they've had to exist in, in cultures built around drinking. Wait, there's more. <laughs> no recourse for reporting bad behaviors. Reporting bad behaviors and getting no response, or worse, getting retaliation, a negative response. Putting up with bigoted and misogynistic language. Lack of HR. Useless HR. Refusing to acknowledge discrimination as an issue. So, how can you fix your leaky bucket? This is a tweet that I saw last year, and it really stuck with me. Um, this company set up emergency safe space for employees who, um, if, they, if they get doxxed, if people attack them by putting their personal information on the internet, then they have a whole system set up for getting you to a safe place, um, protecting your assets, and a company who takes those kind of measures is, first of all, acknowledging that there's a problem. 
And second of all, they're taking concrete action to protect their employees. So who wouldn't run to work for a company like this? Another story that struck me is um, one that Erica Joy wrote last year. Um, Erica is uh, an engineer who previously worked at Google, and she wrote an essay that became very popular last year called The Other Side of Diversity. And she talked about what it's like to work at Google as a black woman, and spoiler alert, it sucked. Um, and she ended up leaving the company. And I was very happy to see that last month she wrote another post called Seeking Happy. And she decided what her goals were for seeking another position that she felt would be healthy and that she could solve the kind of problems that she wanted to solve. And she talks about um, how she found this company. Um, so around the time that Michael Brown was murdered and the protests were happening in Ferguson, um, she looked at her Twitter timeline and noticed that it was kind of cut in half between people who were tweeting about what was going on and the people that she knew in tech. And there was one person who um, stood out from that, uh, the CEO of Slack, Stuart Butterfield, was actively talking about Ferguson and actively checking on people and actively trying to amplify people's voices. So Erica writes that to be a black person in tech is isolating. To see a non-black leader in tech empathizing with the experiences of those in Ferguson and using his platform to amplify the voices and stories of those who might be otherwise ignored was powerful and moving. Seeing Stuart just acknowledge, just acknowledge the reality of what was going on and also seeing, reading on the, the company blog, you know, expressing values for empathy and diversity led Eric to the point where she would have been willing to take any job just to be in that company, just to be in a place where she could go and be her whole self at work. And I can't stress enough how important this is. Black people in this country are literally living in a terrorist state. And the names that you are seeing right now are black people, unarmed black people, who have been killed by terrorists, either police terrorists or civilian terrorists. And there's not a black person in the country who doesn't wake up knowing that we could become a name on this list. So imagine spending eight or 10 or 12 hours a day with people who are completely silent in the face of these conditions. They're completely silent about this horrific reality that a significant portion of the country has to live with. You really can't underestimate the power of just acknowledging people's experiences. It makes such a difference. And it might seem like, what does that have to do with work? But that's where you spend most of your time. That's where we spend the majority of our time. And so we need to be able to be our whole selves at work. So I asked my secret panel, um, well, let me back up. If you want your culture to be truly welcoming to everyone, then it has to be baked in and not sprinkled on. The bucket is actually full of amazing people, and you can have those people as part of your organization if you will just stop driving us away. So I asked my secret panel, what are some of the strengths that you bring to the industry because of your identity? And here's what they had to say. Um, better at UX, so you're thinking about more identities. I've seen both sides of sexism as a man and as a woman, and so I have better communication and more empathy for others. I have different perspectives on privacy and communication and identity. My background in disability politics and my experiences help me to know and listen to other people's experiences and consider edge cases and universal design. Sometimes people just don't know what they don't know because of their worldview, because of the, their particular perspective. So people who have different perspectives can point out things that other people wouldn't realize. And 
There's a concept of code switching, right? People who have to exist in a lot of different realities can be really good at being um, guides and helping people come together um, and explain two different sides um, of, a, of an equation of, an, of a problem. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't leave you with some practical advice from this talk. So let's start with the what not to do. White guys, you have got to stop centering yourself in spaces that are by and for marginalized groups. If your support is contingent on being the center of attention, then that is not actually support, that is a transaction. If you wanna be a good ally, you can support, you can donate, you can attend these events without making it all about you. I know it's really hard. It's always been about you. You don't even know any other way of life, but you can learn. You should be amplifying the voices of people who don't usually get the opportunity to speak. Do not ask your employees who are members of marginalized groups to educate you, to give you advice, or to fix your culture. That is not what you hired them for. They're already doing a job, and you need to give them the space to do it. Don't allow members of your company or your community to act badly without consequence. If you are not willing to keep dangerous elements and known harassers out of your rent events, your pretty diversity privileges really mean nothing. You need to stop thinking about, how do I make my company more diverse? Someone literally said to me, but how do I get women? <laughs> I can't help you with that. But maybe you should start thinking about, how do I make things better for everyone? Because the funny thing happens when you support the most vulnerable people in your organization is that it's better for everyone. I can't tell you how many men I've talked to who say, oh, I finally got to work on a team that was, you know, more, uh, where there was more gender parity and it was amazing. Like we got so much more work done, the environment was better, like it's better for everyone. So I'm not just here to rant that I did actually ask, what are people doing right? What have people done to help create safe and welcoming environments? And I actually got some answers. So things like employee resource groups, mentorship, expressing value for interpersonal skills as well as technical skills, we tend to have the cult of programmer and um, elevate coders uh, above everything else. Just people simply trusting in your work, not having to prove that you're not the secretary, not having to take some fake geek girl test, um, being listened to, having a restroom where you can be comfortable, and flexible work hours. One person reported that her company filed, fired a male coworker who sexually harassed someone and made it clear that there was no tolerance for that behavior. And that sends a powerful message about what your values are and what you want your community and your workplace to be like. Empowering people to lead and learn without feeling the pressure of having to represent their entire group. And again, acknowledging that maybe some shit is going down and maybe some people are having a hard time. And in the end, just letting people do their jobs, treating everyone the same, and providing work-life balance, and not glorifying the 80-hour work week, and offering mentorship, and being explicit. You can ask for help, and actually giving that help. One company hired the ADA initiative to run the Ally Skills Workshop, which is great. And of course, I have my own ideas about how to improve this. So this is my number one tip. My number one tip for improving your culture, it will work for you almost immediately. And that is to jettison your bad apples. <laughs> they will, in fact, poison the entire group. So this is what I think you should do. You should bring them into your office. You should sit them down and you should say, look, it's not your work. It's just not a good culture fit. <laughs> Tell
tell them that you're moving away from sexism, racism, harassment, assault, transphobia, ableism, and towards empathy and mentorship and equal opportunity and teamwork. What about the money? What are we gonna do with all that money? This is, what, this is what I would do if I had a few million dollars hanging around. First, I would equalize all the salaries. I mean, how many years do we have to read about the 70 cents on the dollar, the 60 cents on the dollar, the 54 cents on the dollar? How many years do we have to read about that before you just take some of this money and just make sure that you're paying people fairly? That is so simple. Hire a consultant to help educate you and your employees. Um, I, read a, I read an article um, that Airbnb is actually doing a, a pretty good job at this. And hire a recruiter to help you expand your network so you can stop bugging your one black friend. And if you don't know, here's a few companies to get you started um, that can help you in these areas. All right. I would make sure that all the offices have gender neutral bathrooms. Offer trans inclusive health care. That is literally <laughs> the least, the least that you can do. And stop making those shitty open office plans <laughs> that everyone hates, that are terrible for mental health, that are terrible for productivity. Give people doors or let them work remotely. And male eyelash panel, I did not forget about you. You can handle the child care committees. So let's talk about systemic change. Um, I'm reading a book, thanks Lucas. I'm reading a book called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. And um, Marie Kondo is so obsessed with tidying that she has created a business about it, she's written a book about it, she's made a whole career about tidying. And she's created a method, and she advocates discarding, not room by room, but going through by category, and systemically dealing with all of one category at the same time. And she says that when you do this, when you tidy your space completely and you have such a large um, transformation in a short period of time, it actually changes your mindset so that you don't revert to clutter. So how can we do this in a, inside of a company? Well, what if you just took language? What if you just looked at the language in your company, in your job listings, in your interviews, in your training materials, in your meetings, in your marketing, in your social media, and just discarded all the harmful language and replaced it with inclusive language? and see what kind of a difference that makes in the people who apply for your jobs. See what kind of difference it makes in morale. And now if you don't have a few million dollars laying around, we've got you covered too. Um, the National Center for Women in Information and Technology actually has an entrepre entrepreneurial alliance and if you have fewer than 100 employees, you can join this and they'll give you resources to help you build your culture from the ground up to be inclusive. And closer to home, we have Partners in Diversity. And their mission is to partner with Oregon and Southwest Washington member employers to attract and retain professionals of color. Because it is not easy to get people of color to move here and stay here. A lot of them move here, look around, and go somewhere else. <laughs> so there's a whole organization. They have events. They have an event called Say Hey that happens quarterly. And it's a huge event sponsored by some of the largest companies in Oregon. And I consistently go to these events and I consistently tweet at tech companies about these events and I've yet to ever get a response. And lastly, uh, I would be remiss uh, in not mentioning the new shiny Portland Diversity Pledge that came out uh, just recently. And I'm really happy actually just to see them acknowledging that yes, there is a problem. So that, that's encouraging. But also, these are business people. So I look at this list, and it seems a little vague, right? In business, we like to use SMART goals, right? Specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. So I'd like to see a little more detail on some of these goals. You're going to partner with groups in Portland to assist them in hiring underrepresented groups? Great. Do you know who those groups are? I went to a diversity think tank where I was the only, me and one other person were the only people who even knew about Say Hey. 
which you can literally find out by Googling Portland diversity. So it's great that you're making these gestures, but I'd like to see a little more specifics and a little more effort behind it. Um, it's great that you're gonna increase hiring of women and people of color. Are you gonna measure retention as well? Because what's, you know, again, it's the pipeline versus uh, the sewage plant. Um, and I think there's a glaring omission to this pledge, and that is actually supporting um, organizations by and for underrepresented groups, whether or not you actually get any direct benefit from it. The truth is that these companies have made a lot of choices to end up with the workforces that they have now, and it's gonna take a long time to turn the ship around. And in the meantime, one of the actions that will help is to literally share the wealth that has been withheld from people who have been struggling with these problems for a lot longer and doing this work for a lot longer with a lot less resources. So, AlterConf is coming up. And that is a conference for underrepresented minorities in tech and gaming. And I hear they could use a few more sponsors. So, <clears throat> these are the, the companies uh, who have pledged, made the diversity pledge, and uh, that's the list of AlterConf sponsors. So, I would like to invite the people, the companies who have signed that pledge to sponsor AlterConf this weekend. Um, and you can tweet them and tell them I said so. <laughs> Finally, um, this talk came about because I and many of my peers were frustrated with the disconnect between the talk and the action that is present in a lot of tech circles. Some companies treat diversity like this cool trend that they can jump on because it's good for business. And they want to do a lot of shiny, happy work and get accolades uh, for making the very barest of efforts. And some people in these companies are sincere, but maybe they don't have the buy-in from the top managers that they have to have if there's going to be any hope of success. If we're going to make our industry more representative of the actual population, it's going to start with empathy. Real empathy and giving up some of the power and the money that has been so unevenly distributed for so long. And ultimately, we can't measure only by the numbers. We also have to look at the messy and amorphous, squishy feeling stuff. We have to sort by agony, and we have to create workplaces that welcome people's full identities. If you are uncomfortable, you will know you are making progress. Thank you.